the 2000s would give us the most memorable and aesthetically pleasing era of pop music in recent memory. We had NSYNC, Britney and Christina, Destiny's Child, and so many other icons that are still with us today. All overlapping activities, all being successful, all contributing to the magic that was Y2K culture, which is a huge reason why award shows used to actually be interesting. While the R&B scene was no stranger to girl groups, the market was wide open for more pop girl groups since the monumental debut of the Spice Girls. Enter Dream. Dream was a girl group that formed in 1998 with all members being from California. Ashley Poole was 13 when she saw a television commercial scouting actresses with the number 1-800-BE-A-STAR and she called the number her damn self and booked her own audition. They would ultimately pass on booking her for the acting gig, but since she was already in the building, they thought she should audition for Debbie Fontaine, who was holding auditions that night for a girl group to debut under her own label, Clockwork Entertainment. Ashley would ace that audition. Also plucked from this audition was 13-year-old Holly Blake Arnstein, 14-year-old Melissa Schumann, and 13-year-old Alex Chester. They started recording under the official name First Warning, and they recorded demos Baby, Miss You, and Do You Wanna Dance. But before they would even debut, Alex would eventually be replaced by 13-year-old Diana Ortiz. According to a 2017 blog entry, Alex wrote, They wanted us to sign a recording contract without having our lawyers look it through. And Alex's mom was having absolutely none of that, which I completely agree with, because let's be real, that has slave contract written all over it. And the producers did not like like that pushback, they gave Alex an ultimatum. You either sign this or you're not in the group. And that was the end of Alex. The producers that were working on this group at the time were Vincent Herbert and Kenny Burns. Kenny Burns would prove to have his own motives because he would eventually snake the entire group from Debbie and manage them himself. But if Alex is to be believed, according to her, Vincent Herbert was a toxic mess. Posing as the sixth female slash the Keely Williams of the group, talking mess about one girl to the other, causing conflict, just overall bringing negative energy and for me, what makes this allegation so believable is how his now ex-wife, Tamar Braxton, got fired from the real talk show. He had Tamar fighting with all of these women, specifically Lonnie Love, for years. And lo and behold, when Lonnie finally rats him out for spreading falsehoods about the other women to Tamar, You are being named, the girls are being named, and Vince is doing the naming. Him and Tamar get divorced soon after. If he can allegedly play this game with his own wife, why not a bunch of little girls? I find that to be such an interesting coincidence that two women that have nothing to do with each other are accusing him of the same behavior in two completely different decades. What are the odds of that? Alex also describes an obsession over the girls' weights during her time with Clockwork. Their weights were being tracked, their food was being monitored. So going back to Kenny Burns, I can see why it was easy for him to act as the white knight in that situation and convince all of them to leave Debbie and work with him. Him. But for whatever reason, they would eventually cut ties with Kenny as well, but not before getting them into the grips of Bad Boy Entertainment. Kenny would get them an audition with Puff Daddy, P Diddy, Diddy, whatever he's calling himself this decade, and he did exactly what he does during auditions. He was pretending to ignore them, he was eating, and if you've seen the Making the Band series, this is exactly his usual behavior, but it is kind of cool knowing that he wasn't playing that up for the cameras. That's actually how he does his business. But after the girls were done, he got up, shook their hands, and told them good luck and left the room. And then he came back and gave him a record deal, making them his second girl group after Total, who I mentioned a lot in my last video, and his first pop girl group before Danity Kane. Now the ball was finally rolling. The teeny boppers would slave away making their first album, but drama would continue to follow them into debut. A few days before the release of their first single, Old Debbie was back with a vengeance and she tried to sue Diddy and the girls for whatever money they were about to make. While this was adorable, Diddy was already a big name and big money, so she absolutely lost this lawsuit and Diddy and the girls were free to go on their merry way. And finally, on September 5th of 2000, Dream would officially make their debut with He Loves You Not. And this debut was no joke. The music video opens up in a pure white room with a piano intro, and then the beat drops and you get full-blown pop. The girls break out and dance in their matching baby pink outfits. There's later a fun desert scene. But I want to call attention to the rotating white room scene. This was an homage to NSYNC and their Bye 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 music video, and a statement to the rest of the world that they were there to be the female NSYNC, something Ashley would reiterate on multiple occasions. And the haters tried. Critics were calling this unoriginal. The people that were even working on the music video set were like, nope, not gonna happen. Go home. But this song would go on to peak at number two on the Billboard Hot 100 chart for two weeks behind some of the best to ever do it. Destiny's Child and one of their most iconic singles, Independent Women, for the iconic movie Charlie's Angels. Two girl groups taking over the top two positions of Billboard that would literally never happen again. And the music video also also hit number two on MTV's TRL. Oh, 
can control the show. Total Request Live was a huge MTV show that would count down the top 10 music videos of the day airing Monday through Thursday, and it had a very heavy hand in perpetuating pop culture. Pop stars would drop the world premieres of their music videos on this show, celebrities would go there to make grand announcements like albums and tours, address rumors, have breakdowns. It was like watching a TMZ story unfold before your very eyes. It was a movement. And Dream was honored with being the first and only girl group to be forced retired out of the countdown via the 65 day rule. A rule that was mandated because Britney, Christina, NSYNC, and the Backstreet Boys were so famous that their fandoms were dominating the voting system and holding their faves in the countdown. We had Dream, the little girl group that could, dominating the voting system off of their debut single with absolutely no fandom built. This is as organic as it gets. And out of the show's 10 year run, out of all the girl groups that have been on the show, this is the only girl group song in the TRL's Hall of Fame. He Loves You Not was also honored with being my very first hit clip. Get your groove on with Dream. Hit it! with hit clips. Hit clips were the biggest waste of money. It was all of this hoopla for a snippet of the song. You would not even get the full song, but I had this exact one in color. And despite them being a waste of money, I am still heavily debating buying this one for the nostalgia and because it has their signatures on it. And as a full circle moment for the group, they got to perform this live for the first time as the opening act for NSYNC's No Strings Attached tour. That must have been amazing for them. And if that wasn't enough, the girls were even made into dolls and outfits it's commemorating their smash hit. So you tell me whether or not that was a successful debut. With momentum this hot, Bad Boy Entertainment must have felt all kinds of confidence because on January 23rd of 2001, after only one single, It Was All A Dream was released. The title being an obvious nod to Diddy and his dearly departed Biggie Smalls. The album would go platinum, selling over 1.5 million albums. This made Diddy two for two. Both of his girl groups, Total and Dream, debuted as platinum selling artists and later on, Danity Kane would follow suit. Their next single was This Is Me. The same team that made this song made He Loves You Not, so the vibe was very similar, but the music video concept was more edgy. They ditched the pastel colors for more dominant colors. The fun California desert scene was ditched for a down and dirty nightclub scene. I just really like the way this was done because the second single usually is reminiscent of the artist's breakout hit, but this felt like a conscious effort to show duality. On May 2nd of 2001, the music video hit number one on TRL, making them the first girl group to hit number one on the show. About a month later, in July of 2001, they released the This Is Me remix. This is probably the only remix in the world that is worthy of being its own single, I said what I said. The instrumentals were way more R&B, the lyrics were completely different, and it had an excellent rap feature by their label mate Kane, and Diddy was in there too. They really don't put this kind of production value into remixes anymore. This was such an excellent move, and I'm sure there are people out there that like the remix better than the original. It was really well done. Dream would continue to make various TRL appearances, they even hosted TRL and in July of 2001, Dream would embark on the TRL tour along with fellow girl groups Destiny's Child, 3LW, and a bunch of other artists of the time. And this would eventually close out their debut era. Dream broke onto the music scene like no other. They absolutely rocked this debut. Dream returned to the recording studio to work on the follow-up to It Was All A Dream in 2002. For this album, Dream teamed up with producers such as Scott Storch, Diddy himself, The Underdogs, and Dark Child. Hearing the word Dark Child alone was enough to let us know that we were getting a more mature concept. The Spice Girls recruited him for the Forever album, Say My Name for Destiny's Child, a few songs for TLC's 3D album, so we know we're heading into something new for the Dream Girls. But halfway into the recording process and seemingly out of nowhere, Melissa Schumann would leave the group. Diddy went on TRL, of course, to break the news and said there was no hard feelings, and I'm sure there were no hard feelings on his end, but let's take a look at Melissa's vocal contribution to the group. <laughs> My girl was not even singing in these damn songs. She was clearly there to be a visual. She is stunning gorgeous and they just pigeonholed her. And it would remind me of a situation that Aubrey O'Day would go through later on in Danity Kane. There was an episode of Making the Band where the producers weren't giving Aubrey lines at all and she broke down. She ran into the parking lot and she said, you know what? I can go do pretty, pretty Aubrey somewhere else. It's a little frustrating for me because I want to be recognized to be a legitimate talent and a legitimate part of the group, not some fluff character. She was there to make a contribution and Melissa, much like Aubrey and many other musicians, want to be taken seriously in their role. You're giving up so much of your life promoting, touring, rehearsing, meetings, and Melissa was getting paid dust. It doesn't really seem worth it. So unfortunately, she would take her leave and eventually be replaced by Casey Sheridan. What's up, y'all? 
their sophomore album Reality was completed by early 2003. Dream would make their return with the first single Crazy featuring Loon and I don't know who that is to be honest. The single did not receive the popularity they were used to by this time. The music video alone, it was just weird times. The millennium hit and we were like, yeah, we're in the future. And we got a lot of weird CGI landscapes and music videos. It is what it is. The song itself I actually like. Come to find that the girls always hated it. They never even wanted it on their album. And with the way things turned out, I can't really disagree with them. It was very different. And sometimes when you stray that far from your original concept at the drop of a dime, it can feel less like growth and more awkward and disingenuous. And these feelings were pretty much confirmed by Holly in a 2006 MTV interview. When speaking on the reality era, she said, there was this push for us to be sexual and this emphasis on being skinny. We always had this mentality that we were real, we were really friends, we were really in love with music and having a good time. And suddenly that was not the game. It was how much weight can you lose and how sexual can you be? And Ashley in 2019 would express the same sentiments. Diddy suddenly wanted them to be full on urban, which made no sense. So indeed, the concept change was forced on them and you could tell. And knowing that the group started out being in a very similar toxic situation with Clockwork Entertainment, going back to an environment like that after finding success probably put them in a really bad mindset. And this was really the beginning of the end for them. The song did not hold up to their previous releases. The album kept getting delayed and eventually they were dropped. Their disbandment was never announced, but in the aforementioned Holly interview from 2006, she mentioned that the girls were drifting apart and Diddy was bumping heads with the rest of management on which direction they wanted to take the group in. She also admitted to being the first to leave the group's 2.0 lineup and when the lead singer goes, it's pretty much done. The album Reality was never released, although in 2005 it was randomly released in France, that was weird, and in 2008 it was released on iTunes and eventually taken down, also weird. But today you can find the tracks on YouTube, and if you really want to go into the vault, you could find the two demo albums that they recorded under Clockwork Entertainment and with Alex Chester on Apple Music. After being the very first to leave, Melissa started acting, most notably appearing on Love Don't Cost a Thing with Nick Cannon and Christina Milian in 2003. In 2004, she landed a role in the made-for-TV film The Hollow, starring Kaylee Cuoco and Nick Carter. She and Nick also recorded a single for the movie soundtrack. And in 2005, she starred in the indie slasher film Silent Scream. She had plans to release a solo single, Don't, but the single and album were scrapped, but have since released on iTunes. Ashley went hard at work to pursue a solo career. According to her, she dipped her foot into every genre imaginable. And in 2008, she actually married Casey's brother, DJ showing that everything truly does happen for a reason. As for Casey herself, I read that she started participating in missionary work, but it was only one source, so I'm not sure how factual that is. But if she did, dope. Diana kept a pretty low profile. There's a YouTube performance from 2011 you could find, but she looked beautiful, sang beautifully. Do not get it twisted. All of these women could sing despite the label putting it all on Holly. And speaking of Holly, she joined a co-ed band named World Magnet. This band was a complete 180 from Dream. They were very alternative. They described themselves as a blend between Sade, Coldplay, with a splash of Fleetwood Mac. They have since disbanded, but you could find their music on YouTube and Holly sounds gorgeous in it. And at this point, I figured all was said and done with the group, but in 2008, Melissa announced that she and Ashley were starting a new band after failing to get the original lineup together. They were working on music together and auditioning for new bandmates. The auditions were going miserably, but a year later, they were able to onboard Diana. They settled for a trio and would eventually name themselves Lady Phoenix. This woman group would stray from their original teen pop roots into a mature jazz-inspired sound. In 2010, they pitched a reality show circulating around them trying to make a comeback and conflict arises when Melissa gets pregnant. But unfortunately, a network never picked them up, and a few years later, Melissa confirmed that Lady Phoenix was no more, with Ashley being the first to jump ship this time. In a 2014 interview, Ashley briefly mentioned that they had some creative differences, jazz wasn't her vibe, and by judging from her solo music, I completely agree. The same year, she released a song called If It Feels Right, and this was a dance pop song, and it literally did feel right for her. You can tell she was having a lot of fun in the music video. She looked beautiful. And how 2015 is this video? 2010 to 2015 was just madness. The Jersey Shore came out. Music festivals became mainstream. The only thing we were trying to do was party and BS. And the music video definitely reflected the time. But what she didn't want to mention at the time was that there was so much more conflict going on. Diana came out to the girls during the Lady Phoenix era. And
And in watching this 2014 coming out story, I was really surprised because she had very much talked about boys in the past. You know, questions being asked in my girl group of like, who's your, you know, crush? I would say, you know, Freddie Prince Jr. Who do you like? Does anybody know who? Uh, Freddie Prince Jr. But she would go on to say that she just didn't feel safe coming out in the 2000s. And unfortunately, it still wasn't safe coming out in the 2010s because Ashley did not take this news very well. In 2019, and by her own admission on her podcast, she was being a complete trash bag about it because of her Christian beliefs, which is absolutely miserable to hear. But little did we know that Ashley had been struggling with her own sexuality for what sounds like her entire life. In her words, she was always attracted to girls, so I'm reading that as she was always hiding her sexuality. So in witnessing Diana come out and live her truth, it stirred up a lot of uncomfortable emotions for Ashley because she had been working her entire life suppressing and avoiding what her friend was now putting on the table. So it was uncomfortable, but she was also feeling jealous because Diana was freeing herself and Ashley still couldn't. But ultimately, this situation got her to reassess her relationship with God. It seems like she still has one, which is fantastic for her. And she was able to finally come out to her husband and the world on her podcast. But she did still have to clean up the mess she made with Diana. Ashley invited her on a hike and quite literally begged for her forgiveness on her knees. And luckily, they were able to get back into a good place. And while this ordeal paints Ashley in a very negative light, I would like to reiterate that Diana is not on social media as far as I found. So if Ashley wanted, this story could have never came out. I think holding herself accountable when nobody was even pointing a finger at her was really brave in this day and age. I'm sure she got a lot of hate. I'm sure she continues to get a lot of hate regardless of Diana's forgiveness. And I just think that's worth mentioning. While I wish it didn't happen at all, I'm glad Ashley knew that she was in the wrong and pretty much changed her entire life as a result. And I'm especially thankful for Diana for forgiving her because what was to come may have never happened. On May 29th of 2015, all four original members announced that they were making a comeback. Now uniting as women, they were focused and ready to hit the ground running. They first recorded a cover of Oh Holy Night for the holiday season and assured us that an album was on its way. Then somewhere down the line, one of the guys from O-Town or 98 Degrees, Ashley couldn't remember, was dining at a restaurant that Diana was the manager of and they recognized her, got to talking, and eventually invited Dream on a tour as a supporting act. Talk about fate. The My2K tour took place from July through August of 2016, headlined by 98 Degrees with O-Town, Ryan Cabrera, and now Dream. Ashley mentioned on her podcast that she labeled this the closure tour because she kind of felt like their time was coming to an end. She just kind of had this gut feeling that this this was it, and this was indeed their last tour as a group. But the word closure holds so much weight here. They organized set design, lighting, costume design, choreography, they sung live, so you know a lot of practice had to have been put into it. And this isn't an Ariana Grande tour with a huge production team behind them. They had to be their own team. Melissa took on the role as manager, and they all grinded to give us their best, and in watching what they put together on stage, it absolutely was. They sounded fantastic. You would have never guessed that it had been years since they worked together, and I'm sure that they all look back on this and do feel a sense of closure. It was such a good way to go out. And towards the end of the tour on August 2nd of 2016, the girls released their first single in 13 years titled I Believe, written by the girls themselves. This song was the power ballad that we always deserved from this group. As a girl group stan, I am an absolute sucker for the power ballads. I feel like it is the absolute best part of standing a girl group. And we really got a taste of Ashley's chops in this song. She sounded great. But unfortunately, on August 5th of 2016, Ashley announced via Snap Snapchat and Facebook that Dream had once again disbanded and the new album was scrapped. Such a bummer. Ashley mentioned that some of the members just weren't willing to sacrifice what was needed to prosper in the industry. And when looking at the situation, some are married, some are mothers, some have new careers going for them. And in the adult world, you need money for survival and to support your family. So it's just not the same situation anymore. You can't go back to your parents' house if everything fails. So it was fair. So it sucks, but it was realistic. And that was officially the end of Dream. I found some articles saying that Holly went to school for psychology and began working as an occupational therapist. She has a private IG, so there's that, but she is also married and a mommy. Diana is low-key as per usual. Once I see that somebody doesn't have social media or a public social media, it's plain to see that they want to be left alone, so I choose to respect that. But as I briefly mentioned before the My2K tour, she was working as a manager in the food and beverage industry, so I'm going to assume that she is still thriving in that career. And then for those of you that are curious, Alex Chester is on IG. She 
She went on to become an actor, writer, producer, podcaster, blogger, editor-in-chief of her own magazine, so the girl has been booked and busy. Casey does have social media, but they are generally private, but aside from being Ashley's sister-in-law, she is also married and a mother. For the record, she felt no ways about not being included in the reunion stint. She was never even a paid member of the group. And Melissa and Ashley seem to be very close still. They're both active on social media. Both women are married and mommies. They also still flirt with the idea of making music together. Ashley has the best vibes ever. She's very body positive. Her handle is the dream mom, which I think is so awesome. She absolutely loves her journey. She loves where she came from, where she is, and where she's going. And I wouldn't have half of this information if it wasn't for her openness online so I'd like to extend a special thank you to her for never forgetting about her fans and for feeding us in any way she could throughout the years. Her attitude towards life is just goals. And Melissa our dream goddess I'm so thankful for her openness as well. She has a YouTube channel she live streams a lot and she became somewhat of an activist more recently or should I say pushed into activism because after the My2K tour ended she decided to start living her truth and was met with terrible terrible backlash because it involves a member of the biggest western boy group of all time. So for the sake of this video not being overshadowed by a popular boy group member, we will carry Melissa's story into the next video. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for celebrating Dream with me. They were a fantastic girl group with a phenomenal start to their careers, but their potential just wasn't nurtured by Bad Boy. But with the little we got, they absolutely made a contribution to Pop's golden era. He Loves You Not is an immortal song and I refuse to hear anything otherwise. Once again, thanks for being here guys and I will see you in the next video. And tell me that is not Scott Disick in the audience. That is absolutely him.